Cool. So let's get started. First topic. Um, color bump. Okay, so that was the first thing I saw in the comments. So we're going to go ahead and explain that. Um, it's really pretty easy. Uh, let's pull up. Make sure I'm showing you the right screen here. Okay, so I have these two effects right here uh, called Color Bump and uh, Color Bump 2. One of them goes negative, one goes positive. So on the color wheel, I am basically just using an effect. A uh, Let me pull up the effect here, actually. Um, first, what I'll do, I will store my beams into this template. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to say Group 2. That's my beam group. And then I'm going to right click to edit this line, hit take selection. So now that means it is now a selective effect. I'm going to do that with color bump two as well. I do live right next to the airport, sorry. Um, so now I have my 100 beams uh, selected for this, for this effect. So if we pull up, um, let me just grab go to like a layout view or something. Let's make a quick little layout view. Okay, so these are platinum beams. And these effects, all they are is their flat highs. So flat high form, which is basically just like a value. Okay, it's a value that is immediately jumped to. And then that value is defined by this high value cell over here. So in this color wheel bump down, my value is negative five. Okay. Um, the reason it's a negative five and not a preset in here is because I want the wheel to just bump down by a certain amount, not to an exact value. So that means that I have to make this a, uh, a relative effect, not absolute. So the difference between relative and absolute, in case you don't know, um, and you can you can do this. Um, let, let me explain it like this. So relative means you have an underlying value, like a hard value, the yellow values that you put into the programmer, and then the relative value uses that as like the base position, like that's where it starts. So in this instance, the way I think about it is, okay, my color wheel has a hard value attributed to it. Um, not a hard value, but it's, it's, it's a value, not an effect. So I have it at, let's say red, red on the color wheel. And then white is directly below that on the color wheel. Blue is directly above that. What difference, uh, you know, by the, the amount is it on most fixtures? It's usually about like three or four out of a hundred, uh, which is what this effect line is based off of. It's uh, zero to a hundred. And, uh, I decided that for most of my fixtures, negative five works really well. So when I hit negative five, we can see that it bumps down to white. And then when I hit color wheel bump up, it'll bump up to blue. So all you do then is you just store either of these two on an exec. So let's make a quick little exec page here. Do a playback, do action buttons, and I'll just pick some random page. So I'm going to store that color wheel bump to an exec and then hit the other effect, go here. And then I'm going to sign those as a temp. I'm going to bring up the beam intensity here. So red is the value if we look over on our color picker. Let me say hello to the kitty. Hi. Um, so let me make sure I can show you this here. Yep, okay, just double checking on my screen. So you can see my color picker is reflecting correctly on the layout view. Those are the beam fixtures, right? So if I go to green 
and I click on temp of that color wheel bump that we just we just made, it bumps it down to the next color, which is blue. And the one to the next, uh, to the right of that, is bump up, right? So this is cool because you can actually make like a three-way chase manually. So you have your, your hard value, and then um, you have your effect high, effect low. So again, the difference on the second one is instead of going negative five on the high value, we go to five on the high value. And uh, groups of one. Make sure you have groups of one, otherwise you'll create like, you know. I, actually, I, th I don't think groups of one matters on, on flat high. But that's how it works. Um, so that is color bump. Easy peasy. Uh, this can also work with non-color wheel things if you want to have like bumps to white. Uh, you can do that with CMY fixtures, RGB fixtures, all that stuff. Cool, so that's one topic complete. Um, let's see here. Jeez. Yeah, I, I look at the chat after I talk about a topic. How do I make the color picker grid? There is uh, a video on that on my channel already. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and move on to the next topic. So I'll delete those. Go back to my normal view here. Great. Next topic of discussion, color effects generator. Okay, this was a thing that was highly confusing, I guess, and it's probably my fault. Um, but let me clarify a little bit about this color picker, or this, uh, not the color picker. Everybody knows about the color picker. It's been, it's been fabled for a long time. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the effects generator. So this is just like a user interface that I kind of invented, I guess you can kind of say. So all this stuff is really just uh, lines of code, right? So if I open up this, to edit it, it's there's nothing stored in these sequences except macro command links, right? So let me explain a little bit on the back end of this. This is just a control for my color effects over here. So if I say, let me see how I want to show you this. If I turn all of these to active, it essentially means that I have just changed a bunch of my selective, or excuse me, a bunch of my template color effects over to selective. So now that they're selective, I can call them each and put them into a fader, right? And that fader is over here. Okay, so I'm gonna call this, this brings my 100 spot fixtures into the effect. Then I'm going to store them over on the effect fader. I'm gonna do the same with my wash fixtures. Store, effect gen, merge. Store on the effect generator. Merge, LED strip, whoops. Merge. We got any drop frames? No drop frames, amazing. So is this making sense so far? And then, um, We'll do the last LED effect here, store, merge. Now all of those effects for all those fixtures are stored into this fader. That's, that's really all it is. Um, and then these 
macros over here turn on and off whether or not they're template or spot or template or uh, selective right because selective live updates in uh, all of your playbacks so if you store a selective effect onto that fader any effect changes that you modify will update live uh, on the stage which is pretty cool scrolling in this sucks how do i control my gobos how effective is my color picker for busking versus programming i mean uh that's kind of a weird question uh they're two different things i mean i use them both i'll, I'll busk and use my color picker keep in mind like the color picker is not a programmer thing it's uh it is playbacks executors and uh, sequences How do I make it template or selective? All right, let's take a peek at that macro. That's a good question. So my spots on macro looks like this. So first we go into blind edit. We're gonna clear the selection. So that means that anything that was in the blind editor, which actually that's a really good topic to explain to. We'll explain blind edit right after this. So now let's look at this uh, macro. So my spot sound macro, basically, let's talk through it in plain English. So we go into the blind editor so that there's nothing that's going to be output to the stage and a modification. We're going to clear anything that was in the blind editor, then we're going to select group 11, which is my spots symmetric group, which I can actually change this to say, I'm, I'm trying to like redo my show file so that it uses the names of things rather than just the IDs. So I'll say group spots sim. Uh, the reason we're selecting the symmetrical selection is because I want the effect, anything that I'm using like with effects and taking selection, I want I want those to always be mirrored through the stage because it just it just looks the best. So that is why um, that's why that it is spot sim instead of just the regular spots group. I'll, let's uh, let's add that to the list after blind edit symmetrical selection. We'll talk about that. Okay, back to the macro. Okay, so then we select our spots sim group, and then we store that effect in the effect lines for our um, our color macro or our color effect. Excuse me. So we don't add any parameters. We don't change anything in the color. We're just selecting the group and then storing, and then uh, that that makes it a selective effect. Then we clear all, and we blind edit off. That's all this is. And then to turn it off, it's really pretty much the exact opposite, except we're not taking any selection at all. So blind edit, clear the selection. And then while the selection is zero, there's nothing in our programmer, we store at that effect again. And that turns it back into a template effect. Hopefully that makes sense. And that's how all of these are, okay? And then the main, like the effects over here. So let's just turn all of these on and let's open LED two. Okay. So these are uh, the LED strip. Actually, let's do open LED strip. So our low value, as you can see is a preset, which means that it's absolute. So this won't work with relative. You have to do absolute because it's relating to colors, um, chasing between two exact values. So in this case, I'm using preset 4.100, which is four means it's a color preset. Then 100 is the number. Uh, so we have our low effects and our high effects preset. And you can see those presets are here on this page. We have low effects and we have high effects. And all I'm doing when I'm changing like which color that I want to morph into the low side and the high side, I'm just copying with a macro from my color presets up here. So if I am going from orange to blue, all it's saying is um, 
I'm going to change my low effects value. So it's just going to change the low effects value by copying from the, uh, the orange color preset and overwriting that, or excuse me, merging that into the low preset on the low effects. Uh, and then that is referenced by the effects that we stored into the fader. Hopefully, hopefully that makes sense a little bit. All right. I hate that. Okay, so here's the really shitty thing. YouTube doesn't auto scroll the comments. How does console frame size affect your shows? I'm not sure what you mean. Do you have a quick way to go between color mixing and say color wheel fixtures that have both like a platinum FLX? Uh, if it has, this is just for, for the most part, if it has color mixing, I won't even touch the color wheel unless I'm doing something like really fast bumps from red to white. Uh, and I'm doing that like as a special effect, not as a part of like the busking show. If I'm just busking, I won't even touch the color wheel. Uh, unless there's like a really cool color in there, like or a really, really, really good indigo or something like that, then I'll use it. But for the most part, I don't even touch it. So like the FLX, like you're saying, I mean, a lot of fixtures have both color wheels and um, and color mixing engines nowadays. And I would say the reason for that is because if you think about it, most color wheels uh, sequentially along along the along the wheel, it's really just a bunch of complementary colors next to each other. So that is like the real strength of a color wheel is being able to bump really, really fast between adjacent colors, which are usually pretty complementary. Um, kind of like how I do with the color bump that we just explained. Okay, the non auto scrolling thing, how to play show without motor faders. You must not know. Hello, Christian, my man. What's up, dude? What's up, milady? What's up, Alec? Oh, I forgot. I made you, uh, made you a moderator. Make sure to keep these guys in line, okay? Please, keep them in line for me. Um, yeah, I play show without motor faders more than I play with motor faders, just because I'm not that. Uh, I guess I'm not that uh, elite yet to demand an MA full size or a light. I usually end up using my on PC wing and a fader wing. Yeah. How did you color your faders? You can't color your faders. Uh, faders are all the same color. <laughs> They're all yellow. MA will not allow you to do that. Oh, I want to show you guys a funny thing that uh, Alex Hughes over at... Um, fuck, what did I... Anyways, Alex Hughes showed me this funny little bug that I didn't know existed. I think it's it's got to be a bug. You can actually label your preset types. So if you do assign assign, you can actually press on preset type color and relabel it to Christian Jackson. And now every time you call that preset, it'll call my name. And it's even in the uh, <laughs> it's even in the, the pool icon. That's funny. The pool title. We're gonna change that back though. That's gotta be a bug. Oh, how I, okay, so those are just fixed faders. I guess it's technically a different color fader. Uh, yeah, fixing faders just keeps them on your current page, even if they're not on your current page. So MA, I'm not actually, I think you can do like 9,999 pages, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but yeah, if you want your faders, even when you're moving through on the motorized fader section, uh, if you want, like in my case, I want these five, six faders to always be one, two, three, four, five, six no matter what page I'm on. Um, that's how I do that. Yes, can mass replacement of changing images affect the processing of the console? Yes, it absolutely will, especially if you have, uh, if you have an older one, like one of the four gigabyte uh, models, it'll be tough on the, it'll be tough on the console. So what I did to mitigate that is I made my images super, super small. Um, so for example, on my ever famous layout view here, each one of these squares that you see, the, the filled ones, like if I 
hit this orange. So these orange squares here are all, I think I want to say four pixels by four pixels. They're not actually as big as they look in here because MA will stretch it to fit uh, your, um, your macro icon on the screen. So yeah, for filled ones, I think I did like four pixels by four pixels. And then these, the ones with the, the frame around them, I want to say it's like actually like 15 by 15. So you have just have to keep the images super small and uh, make sure that the desk uh, has the, the eight gigabyte upgrade. And if you're running on PC, if you're using a computer that has a hard drive, a spinning hard drive, you're gonna have a really, really bad time because it just, it won't be fast enough. You have to have an SSD. Yeah, so if the venue has just a command wing versus a full size, here's the thing, I program, my show is programmed right now to work best on an MA2 Lite because uh, that's the console that I get most often. If I get a full size, sweet, that's awesome. But for the most part, I usually end up with a Lite and just coincidentally enough, my command wing plus my MIDI con wing is the exact same number of faders and buttons as on a Lite. So that's the way I do it. And for the most part, I don't change pages too often except for button pages. Uh, my faders almost always stay on one page. Programming tips video, please. Yeah, you're watching it. Let's move on to the next topic. Uh, symmetrical selection. This is a good one. This is one that is uh, was confusing to me, and then once I understood it, it totally changed uh, changed the game. So, normally, if you're just selecting fixtures, and let's. Let's just do this with, let's make up an imaginary stage here with a hundred of my beams in this show. So we will do like, let's just do groups of, hmm, actually let's do 96. So I'm gonna take these last four, and we'll move them out of the way. And then uh, let's go so I'm just making this layout view to kind of show you what I would do to make a symmetrical selection. Uh, the layout view, the way I'm doing it right now, essentially, let's just do blocks of eight here. And matrix blocks eight. Uh, you can't see what I'm doing right now and that's okay. Uh, layout view is really useful for doing this part of pre-programming. This is like maybe the most important part of pre-programming. It's just doing the layout views. Uh, and that's just so that you can make these symmetrical selections. Come on. This is getting frustrating. I'm just trying to make blocks of eight, blocks of 12. It's just blocks of 12. Make it go by faster. Okay, next block of 12. So let's imagine that we had a stage that had some sort of layout like this, which is, this is 96 uh, platinum beam 5Rs. So this is our stage, okay? This is what we're working with. And we'll just store this layout view so we don't lose it. So normally, if I were to just create, uh, if I were to just grab the original selection of, I think it's like, fixture number 201 through 300, which is all my beams. If I highlight and next through all of these, it's just gonna go through the index value, right? Left to right. But that doesn't look best for effects and other things like that. So symmetrical values work something like this. You need to, you need to think about like creating a, a lasso 
or a path through the fixtures by selecting them in a way that is uh, symmetric and mirrored on both sides, right? So let's look at my layout view here and I will kind of create a symmetric selection as I would do it if this were an actual festival. So we'll start from the middle and we will go back this way, back this way. No, nope, I fucked it up. We'll do this a different way. It takes a little bit of trial and error. So we'll continue out this way, back to the middle, snake in. Oops. Actually, we'll do. Uh, oops. Snake in, and then we'll select this whole front row. Snake back in. Snake back out. Bam. So there, we just made a symmetrical selection, and I will store that into my beams symmetric um, group selection. Because keep in mind, groups, when you call groups, it's just recalling the exact sequence of fixtures that you stored to the group. Uh, let's see, how many people we got watching? 218, nice. Very nice. Cool. A lot of people learning today. I like that. Um, anyways, symmetrical selections. So now we have that stored. If we go over and apply that to our uh, Sharpie sign effect, and we just go in here and we say take selection and remove individuals. And if we apply that effect, exit out here. And we apply that effect and turn highlight off because I'm an idiot. Then you can see we have a symmetrical thing going on and it's pretty cool. Change it to white so it's a little easier to see. So that is why symmetric selection is important. Uh, it, it really makes everything look cohesive, like you know what you're doing. Here's a close up of it. Right, so all you do, so it's kind of like this. You make all your layout views after you get the plot. Uh, and then once you get all your layout views, you go through and you make, you manually do all the symmetrical selections. Then you store the symmetrical selections and then you go in to your effects and then update all of your effects with those symmetrical selections. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me, but <laughs> that's just because I've been doing it forever. I'm gonna post this link in my Facebook real quick so my friends can see how cool I am. Okay, so I think, uh, does that explain symmetrical selections enough for everybody? I think that's pretty obvious um, once I show it that way. Uh, and then we can update our other effects that same way. And you can see it's just a really, really fast way of making everything, everything jive and look really good. Okay, check that one off the list, symmetrical selection. Uh, rig odd even. Uh, this, this I kind of don't want to show you, <laughs> uh, mainly because the way I do it is super sloppy, um, like super sloppy. I need to, um, I need to work on the way I do it. I want to do it with effects, but right now I use values. Basically, I want to eventually get my whole show file to only be using effect values and selective effects since they live update. But let me walk through how I would do rig odd even. Uh, so basically, let's grab all of our beams, beam sim. And what I'm going to do is I am going to store 
two identical sequences, two executors. So I'm gonna hit dot dot on the command overlay that brings our dimmer value to zero. That's a shortcut for taking everything to zero. And then I'm also going to stomp the effect. So now we have no effect, no value, all the lights are off. Now I'm going to go store that. Uh, let me pull this up here. So I'm gonna store that to a sequence and an executor. When you store on an executor, it automatically generates the next available sequence. In case you didn't know that, um, the, the desk kind of does all that work for you. So now I have this sequence and I'm going to copy the contents without copying the sequence. Because if I just hit copy, we're gonna create two identical playbacks with uh, the same sequence reference. If I wanna create a new sequence, the fastest way I've found is just hit on, on to call it and then store as a new sequence, okay? Pretty easy. So you can see the upper right hand corner says 1160, 1161. That refers to the sequence number in the sequence pool. Now, what I'm gonna do, uh, remember, if we bring up our beam executor, so neither of these playbacks are doing anything yet, but if I turn one of them on, our lights should go to zero, and they do. Uh, they both should do the same thing, and they overwrite each other, which means that they have the same content, uh, same, same parameters and same effects in the sequence since they overwrite each other. But what I wanna do, I wanna change that to a temp. So I'm gonna do assign temp, assign, whoops, not assign top, we'll do assign temp. So now these are both temp buttons. So you can see we flash the whole rig on and off by pressing those buttons. But I want some of them to flash on, right? So we've stored the zero value, but now I'm gonna go back, click beam symmetric, and I'm going to go into a matrix, do interleave of two, hit next, hit full, and then go back and store merge into that first sequence, merge. Then we'll hit next again, full, store on the second sequence, merge. Now, you can see when I click on this one, it flashes half of the rig. And if I latch that by hitting on and then clicking the button, come on, on. Why are you not letting me on? Mm, that's a little confusing. Go. Weird. I'm having a brain fart why it's not letting me keep that on. Maybe it's a priority issue. Um, I'm not sure why it's not letting me. Let me do a high priority. I swear I know exactly what I'm doing, guys. I really don't. So let's try that again. Try on. I'm not sure why it won't let me do that. Let me try something else here. Very strange. Try one last trick. So that's a little weird. I'm not sure why I couldn't hit go on the command and then do it that way. But this is this is what I was gonna do anyways. So when I do these even odd like rig flashes, I make these two sequences and then I can hold down either one and then tap with my finger, you know, just to the beat, the other one, and that'll flash even odd, even odd, even odd. So this one is currently active. So we can see on the layout view um, up on that screen, one of these screens up here. Um, and I also, just so you know, I have this laid out kind of like how an MA is laid out. So if you see over here, this is like screen one, the one you have down in the little like on the console, on the, the command multi, blah, blah, whatever the fuck, nine inch screen. 
And then up there, yeah, up there, that's screen two, the one that's directly above that. So that would be like screen two. And then directly above me is screen three. So it's kind of like uh, we're using an MA light here. And so yeah, now as I tap in this other button, see how they're flashing back and forth? That's really all it is. So you, you store the zero value and the zero, uh, you store the zero dimmer value and stomp it onto two identical sequences, but different numbered sequences, keep that in mind. Um, and then you make one of those sequences with half of the fixtures on, and then you make the other sequence with the other half of the fixtures on, and then you tap between the two. That's really it. I'm moving my hands a lot, sorry. Okay, so that should hopefully explain even odd. And you can do that per type, or per, per uh, the, whole, the whole rig. You can do that with effects as well. Uh, with high, low, again, PWM with a zero speed. <laughs> Someone just uh, shared me the that Lincoln Park is coming to town. <laughs> I can't wait. Oh, Jesus. Uh, anyways, let's look back at the chat here. Who's talking? Oh, we got 239 viewers. That's a lot. What's new in my show file? I am about to show you that. That is coming up very soon. Uh, I think the shortcuts in MA on PC are not helpful for me. You need help with programming tomorrow? Dude. I don't know how to help you. <laughs> Can you show the effect I asked you about when I saw you in DC, the pinwheel effect? Yeah, I, I wasn't really wanting to open MA3D, but I think I can do that in stage view. Yeah, pinwheel effect. Uh, that is from, let me pull up the video that he's talking about. Actually, I'll link it on the, on the screen when this is actually published. Uh, he's asking about the pinwheel effect. My cat's name is Cool. C O O L. First, I had I had a cat before her. His name was Cool, but with a K. And uh, as you can tell, I'm a very creative individual. All right, so let's do stage. Pinwheel effect, yes. The all famous pinwheel effect. How was Coachella? I wasn't there. If you watched my whole video, you would have known that. You would have known that. I just did the programming, um, pre-programming. Okay, stage view, pinwheel effect. This is like super fun, I love this one. So we're going to grab the symmetric selection um, that we were just dealing with. So I'm gonna go make a pool real quick, take the kids to the pool, beam symmetric. So we just selected all of those and I am going to go over to Selective Effects, Sharpie Circle, Take Selection. Let me show you on this screen here. Okay, so this is what you're gonna put in your effect line editor to make this effect. Uh, actually, I've kind of, I've lately started doing negative 75 and positive 75 as my high, low pan tilt values. You don't wanna do like full 90 deflection either way because I don't know. It just, it seems like a lot and I never really go out that far. Um, so all you do, uh, your pan line, just literally just import the default circle. It's you, if you go load predefined and you scroll down, click on pan tilt circle and that'll get you half of the way here. Change this to move speed, change your high, low value your phase is all fine. That is all fine. And then you want to change wings to negative two on pan, the pan line, and then tilt to positive two. Then we're going to scroll over to groups, which is right here. And I'm going to do groups of three. That's it. That is, I, I'm telling you, that is, that is all it is to the pinwheel effect. Um, so let's see how that looks. So I'm going to put my beams at full, whoa, that is fast. Slow down a little bit there. 
we'll stomp that too. So let's move these into a position where we can kind of see a little better. Position we'll do a uh, negative 45. Then we'll pan, we'll orbit. And yeah, let's maybe, I don't know, change them to white or something. Cool, now I'm going to bring that fader up, my beam size fader. And that's it, that's it, dude. That's the pinwheel effect, the, the world famous Christian Jackson pinwheel effect is literally just a predefined effect. You heard it here first. I'm 12 and need help with tips with programming. Uh, if you could ask a specific question, that would be great. <laughs> does ABC MIDI work with MA2 on PC? Yes, it does. Any any USB MIDI device will probably work just fine, but you may need to have a translator like uh, I use Bohm's, uh, Bohm's Pro, and it's just a translator to change control change values like you get with faders into uh, notes because the only thing that MA listens to is notes. How do I start from nothing becoming an LD besides doing online research and learning on PC? That's what I did, fam. So I, let me, let me just give you the baseline. I'm making like a, an actual video about how I really kind of got into it, but the basics goes something like this. Um, when I moved out here, I knew just like, hmm, let me see here. When I moved out here to Seattle, I had been doing little club shows with like four Martin Mania STX 500 scanners and a couple of American DJ LED bars. And I was using Light Jockey uh, 2.95. And I didn't know anything about consoles. I didn't know anything about power delivery. I didn't know anything about real DMX. I'd never seen a five pin DMX cable in my life. Um, and I just started working as a stagehand. So I worked as a stagehand for about two years and worked at the nightclub Q, which you guys see in some of my videos. Um, and I just worked at those two places doing like freelance. Um, so, so basically I would freelance stagehand during the day and I would just do everything I could to like be by the lighting team. So I would, I wasn't work. I never worked for Rhino, thank God. But, uh, I did work for some like corporate AV teams and, uh, I got picked up by R90 to kind of start doing lighting stagehand stuff. So it was like more specific to lighting because they saw that, you know, I wasn't a total idiot. I knew how to run a line of DMX. I knew which way the pins went. And that was all stuff that I learned on my own back home in Montana. Then as soon as I kind of like made a name for myself as like not being a total idiot and showing up on time, then I kind of started spending more and more time learning how to use the MA. And I, any time that I had off, I would go hang out with whoever was doing the lighting, uh, who was actually running the board, talk to them, introduce myself, tell them who I was, uh, what I wanted to do. And over the course of two years, that gave me enough, I don't wanna say like street cred or anything like that, but it gave me enough like um, acknowledgement in the local like community of lighting people that uh, people started putting me on gigs. And you know, in my free time when I wasn't working at the club, so I would like freelance, you know, eight hours a day during the day, setting up shows, building trust towers, things like that. Uh, and then at the night, at night, I would go and work at the club. So I was like, eat, sleep, breathe, lighting nonstop, right? And uh, MA was really fascinating for me because the club that I worked at had an on PC command wing. And I had never like touched one before, didn't know how to use it, but I was kind of like forced into using it. And um, yeah, I would go home and learn how to use the software on my own. And that was like the best thing I could have done, honestly, was just figure out how all this stuff works, how to troubleshoot things. And pretty soon I got known as the guy who would answer the phone and help you with any MA questions that you might have. Because um, people knew that I was learning it. People knew that I was good at it. And eventually people just started hiring me <laughs> instead of uh, being the guy who they would call for help. 
I was now like starting to move my way up the list of people who they called. And that's kind of how I got where I am. That's pretty much it. How can you art output ArtNet without MA node? You can't. You need uh you need an on PC, command wing, fader wing, some sort of hardware. Sorry, fam. Uh I was using the wrong form. Yeah, don't you <laughs> yeah, make sure you use the right form. What looks good and what doesn't look good? This has got to be a troll. No, it has to be a troll. I think, uh, <laughs> oh my God, that's so funny. I'm eight, what's strobe? <laughs> Do you use RDM often? Never once, I've never once used RDM. Except as like, just to test it out and see what it did. And it was pretty cool. You can see like temperatures and all sorts of cool shit. HD lighting live in one hour. Are they doing a, uh, they're doing a stream today? I think I got more viewers than their stream. <laughs> 250 solid. You guys, fucking cool. Oh, you have a sticker for my Pelican? My Pelican's getting pretty full of stickers. Thank you. How can you control pixel mapping on an MA console? I have a video on that on my channel. You should go check that out after you finish watching this stream. Uh, anyways, let's get back to our list of things. So we talked about symmetrical selection. We talked about rig odd even, cloning macros. Let's do this. Okay, cloning macros. This is actually pretty easy. Um, and let's do this um, as if, let's pretend like, let me think here. Let's pretend like I just started a new show. So I'm gonna save this one. And let's say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put up face cam because I need to log into my shit. I don't want you guys seeing my password. Basically, um, so I have my start show saved. That's the one we were just looking at. Um, I'm going to pretend like we're going to PSR uh, the show that I'm working on for this weekend. I, I'm not, I swear to God, I'm not staring at the ceiling. I just have like a monitor up here that you can't see. So I'm going to pop back in. We're going to PSR um, the show for Bliss. And we'll, we'll kind of make a start file, but it's not really going to be what I use. So what I did, uh, we're loaded into my start show. That's the one that is currently loaded into memory. I'm going to go to partial show read initialize, and we're going to scroll to my bliss show. Now, uh, we'll pull up the partial show read, and you can use the wizard, but I'm just going to show you the way I do it just to make sure it actually works. So what you need to do, you just need to scroll through here and make sure there are no overlapping um, conflicts. The left side shows the show uh, fixtures in my current file and the right shows the partial show read. So let's go select all these guys and we're going to hit use other, use other stage. And then all we do is we hit prepare. Fantastic. Now I am going to delete um, my groups 1 through 19. Delete group, whoops. Delete group 1 through 19. Please. Okay. Now I'm going to go into auto create, scroll down, uh, change to layer, and I am just going to select all those layers that we just imported through the partial show read, which I guess I should show you actually. It is actually, if we go into partial, if we go into my, my layers, you can see it added all of those partial show read ones that weren't in my, my show file before. They're now in here, right here. So now we're gonna go over to auto create, choose layer, hot box, rain, rain, rain box, drop box, um, and we're going to create those groups. Created groups. Cool. 
that's partial show reading, guys. <laughs> or at least as far as I use it. Um, then, this is only the first half, though. Then we need to clone. So those fixtures are imported, but they don't have any data associated with them. They are just straight imported fixture types. What we need to do now is clone. So uh, what I do, I pull up, um, let's look at our main screen here, which I don't know if I created a view for this. Let me just add this real quick. Game capture on PC. Thanks, XSplit. I think I, I somehow got around XSplit uh, caring about my license. Anyways, uh, so I have these groups that we just imported through partial show read. Now all I'm gonna do is sort them according to how I usually have um, my spots, beams, washes laid out. So we go spots first, uh, beams next, washes next, and then atomics and stuff that'll go over here. Uh, Platinum spot 15R is actually a front wash. And then we will move hot boxes to LED zone, LEDs nuts. And now we'll go over to a different page, which is our cloning page. So this is just a bunch of macros to clone stuff. Uh, Cloning is actually like remarkably easy once you figure it out. Uh, there's a couple ways you can do it. The way I do it is through a command line with these macros, but if you're a little scared of that, this is what you can do. You can see on my screen here, I have command line feedback. That's just for me to make sure that everything clones correctly. Um, I have two group pools up here. One starts at one, one starts at 101. These 101 groups are references to let me pull it up here. References to these spot, all these fixtures in here. So these are the ones that have all the data. These have all the data in them. Okay. Um, and what I need to do is I need to take the data from these fixtures and clone it into these ones up here. There's a couple ways you can do that. Um, one way, if you're brand new to this and you want to not fuck up, you, you can do the clone menu. So if you go into setup, and I'm gonna switch this over to screen three. Go over to setup, and we go to cloning. Then all you do is you take your clone group. So I'll grab all this, and keep in mind all of these, these have all of the data in them, okay? Clone spots. So we're gonna clone from, take selection, that just pulled all of our fixtures in here. Then uh, we'll clear selection and then we'll grab all of our spot fixtures and then we will do take selection over here. So now all we do, highlight, prepare, clone, low prio merge. They now have all the data, that's it. And then I just have macros that do that, right? Um, and you can clone from a lesser number to a greater number, it'll just repeat, it'll just repeat the data. Um, so you could have just one clone source and you can have 500 destinations. It doesn't matter. So uh, next up, I'll show you how my macros kind of work. So like I said, I, I organize them according to how they're supposed to work. This one is supposed to be clone MH1s. And uh, clone MH2. I'm kind of like relabeling all my stuff as I go here, like I said. Um, I'm treating the LED strips as, or I'm treating the hot boxes as LED strips, and then I'm going to move my atomics. Move atomic. Here we go. Cool. So, really, all I have to do when I, when I, after I partial show read in these groups, I hit clone spots, low prior merge, clone beams. Low prio merge, clone MH to MH ones. Low prio merge, clone LED strip. Low prio merge, clone atomics. Low prio merge. Now all of the data has been copied to the house rig show file or the house rig fixtures. Excuse me. That's it. Then I go through and I update my spot effects. 
update spot effects, update beam effects, update uh, wash effects, update LED effects, update strobe effects. And that is like 90% of the show. Show is pretty much done right there. <laughs> like it's, it's kind of criminal how easy it is once you figure out cloning and partial show read, things like that. Hopefully that makes uh, somewhat senseful. Uh, I don't know what, what am I trying to say? I don't even know. Caps, caps lock key is broken. Noah, you're a troll. I love it. That's the reason Christian is now my new Leer Master. Thanks, bro. Yeah, yeah, don't take the MA2 class. Just download the shit. Just download that shit. Any in and out can be changed to an in and out on MA nodes. Yes. Let's see if I did I miss any questions. I use Artnet on almost every show. What do I think about Hog? I don't have an opinion on Hog really. What's up, David G G L B? What up, fam? Two hundred and forty people watching right now. Pretty good numbers, guys. Thank you for watching. ACT lighting live in one hour. Yeah, let's watch that all together. We should pull up their stream on my stream. <laughs> How do you update those effects? That is top secret confidential information, good sir. Um, no, I'll show you. Uh, this is how you update those effects. So I just have um, a sequence that, let's just take, um, I'm saying um a lot, I'm sorry. We'll grab uh, beam five R's and all you do, and I have a macro that does this, but I'm not sharing the macro because that is one thing I am gonna keep a little secret for right now. Just for now, I promise. Um, so grab all beam five R's. Then I'm gonna go over to my beam movements and all we do is we hit take selection. Move through all of these, take selection. Take selection. Take selection. Take selection, you get the idea. That's it. So you, you grab your symmetrical effect or grab your symmetrical group. I haven't made one because this is a new show file that we just started. Um, color picker in the top right have a specific name. No, just the Christian Jackson color picker that's world famous now for some reason. That's what I call it. Cool. That's it. Now your effects are updated. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Uh, we can highlight them and check it out. Yep, see? They're working. These are the fixtures we just PSR'd in. We just double check that all these are working. Pan tilt cross, yep, working. Pan sign, can't tell. Pan scan, yep. It's all working, guys. It's like my macros are designed to do what they do. Okay. What else? What is on my all my execs under screen one? Good question. Um, blinder stuff. All of my all my bump buttons are temps, right? That's just how I program, I guess. I don't really use anything else for buttons, at least. Sometimes I'll use a go. Um, but here's one thing I did want to show you. Okay, this is really cool. I showed the macro in a previous stream. No, I haven't. <laughs> I saw some shitlord try to copy it on another the other day. <laughs> yeah keep in mind the the beauty of the color picker that i have is that it doesn't do anything with the programmer it's not a programmer thing as far as values are concerned at least okay um this is one thing i've been excited to show off so this if you've just been sitting there not paying attention this is a good one to pay attention to I promise so i have started working on this screen a lot more heavily. I'm not quite done with it, but let me kind of explain what is going on here. This is a movement, and I, I kind of just threw gobos in here for right now because I want to consolidate all of this to fit on a, uh, a light. 
um, not a full size. So that's why the gobos are here. But ignore that for now. Everything else besides the gobos on here is for movements and positions. But the thing I want to direct your attention to right now is these, this row down here that says start pan, start tilt, um, those things. Um, for some reason, it is kind of messed up. Let me see here. This needs to be end. Uh, so I messed up when I made this last night. I was really tired when I did it, but I can explain kind of what is going on here. So I have this thing in my show. Um, oh yeah, subscribe by the way, if you're not subscribed and uh, like me on Instagram, just make me feel better. Uh, we're going to change this a little bit. This got a little bit fuckered, which is fine. 5-3. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to make a quick little sequence pool to correct this. So what I did, I fucked up by just copying the sequence instead of creating a new, a new thing entirely. So here's what we're going to do going to delete this, delete this, and now we're going to copy sequence 1155, oh wait, I do have these already, what am I talking about, so I'll do n pan, assign n tilt, Cool. Okay. I did it right. I don't know why they weren't showing up though. That's really strange. Anyways. Okay. Here we go. So what I like to do, there's this the part of the show where there's like all of a sudden everything just goes black and there's like two and a half seconds of like pretty much silence or breakdown. And then bam, like everything comes back in the show. And I like to kind of start that part of the show off by having the beams static in one position and then right as like the drum hits right as the bass line comes in they move into another position as they turn on and then they go back to moving as they were um you can see that in a couple of my like um i think i'll link it up on the screen when the show is or when this is actually uploaded um, but i use it pretty frequently and i decided to make it a lot more versatile so what i have here is um, pull it up. Nope, not my face. Okay, we'll just look at it from this screen. What I have here is a cue list of different start positions and end positions for pan and tilt. So if I want to start with my beams in black in x1 position and down 90 down 45 and then when i hit my second key i want them to be up and straight uh i would just go and these aren't labeled yet <laughs> of course <laughs> so let me label those real quick um this is the this is the fun part of programming guys is just labeling all of these things Um, actually, I'm not going to bother labeling them. Let's just pretend for a minute because it's not totally done yet. So, and then I want them to be straight and like max tilt up. So what I do is I just go through here through the start and the end. And as I do that, it's copying different values or copying different presets into this start and end position um, preset you see on the screen here over on screen number two, which is, I think that one um, so you can see I have these positions here start position end position all of these are doing is they're saying um, copy all of the data from that pan preset that I selected and paste it into that start preset and then same thing with the end preset and the start preset is also stored with a dimmer value of zero so when I hold it down the lights go black and they go into the position that I have described 
with these buttons. So X1, 45 degrees down. Then when I hit the second button, kind of like how we do the even odd thing, uh, the lights will move into that position and turn on at the same time. And then I've also got a, a cute little cheeky option for doing a, a delay from the center so that they just kind of like, like fingers are just kind of like whoosh, out like that. Top two screens are the same. Oh, shoot. This is a huge bug with XSplit. Screen, see, it shows up as screen three on here, but it's showing up as screen two. Thank you for telling me that. This might die if, if, the, <laughs> if it goes dead. All right, there we go, we're back. This is like a huge problem with XSplit. I don't know why it does that. It's super frustrating. The delay thing, you just have to store delay values with a command line, with this, with the symmetrical selection. So you, you first call the symmetrical selection. Uh, you say like uh, group and then in parentheses beams sim in my case. And then in the, the next line, you say, uh, you, you do the delay. So then you, through the programmer or through the command line, you edit the delay to say uh, one through zero through zero, or sorry, excuse me, one through zero through one. So that means that the fixtures at the end, both ends are going to be taking one second to do that movement. They're gonna be delayed by one second and the fixtures in the middle are starting at zero. So as soon as you press the button, those ones start and then they all over time will follow. Center out color fade. I don't do the color fade thing. So I think I could figure it out though. It doesn't seem too hard. Okay, it does seem pretty hard. Cool, okay, OBS man, it's awesome. Yeah, I know, but I have free XSplit and it has more options and it's just easier for me. I hate OBS. Anyways, um, so yeah, I select a start position and then I select an end position and that automatically transfers because we're using, um, it transfers to this beam start and beam end. And this should be ignore exact time. I should have no fade. Why does this have a fade? Weird. Shouldn't be fading. Ignore exact time. It's like some really weird shit going on in my show file. I'm not sure why. Showing a fade of zero. I don't think it, I don't think delay shows as a fade time. Maybe it does. I don't think so. Anyways, um, so yeah, when I hold this one down and then I click on beam end, it, it uses those two different start and end positions as a reference. Pretty proud of that one. Uh, next up okay this is another feature that is currently in development um i haven't finished it yet i finished one of them but let me kind of explain how it works this is a little more complex so you see i have um, this broken up into sections again so this whole left section you're my number one fan from hungary Dude, with your color, do you use CMY? Always CMY. Oh yeah, the sequence list again, since those were weird. Yeah, I'll show those real quick. This is what it looks like. So these, this is like where I change the start pan position for when I hold down the button, when they go to black. So all it is doing is saying set var start pan equals 82 and 82 references these position presets over here. So 82 is the straight position, 83 is the fan out, 84 is fan out too. So it is literally just saying start pan 82. So that's defining my start pan position is there. Then macro 344, what that does, let me pull that up. 
Hmm, we'll just do edit macro 344. Because I'm not sure where it is. Uh, and that says copy preset two dot and then the user variable end pan at preset 2.157. So what it's doing is once you've selected which pan position you want, it's immediately copy merging it into the start position preset. So it's it's kind of it's actually a lot like the layout view copying one image to another, except you're copying the preset values from the stored preset in my uh, position pool up here into the start position preset for the executor. That's all it is. I hope that makes sense. Joshua Lopez, what's up? Victor, what's up, Victor? Pretty intimate question, but what do you assign to your U1, U4 buttons? I actually don't even use them. I don't even know what, what would I use them for? I don't even know what they do. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be honest. I'll be hundred percent honest. I didn't know you could do anything with those. You can, where do I do that? It's like a pro where, where do I do that? Is it console settings, user settings, miss keys. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Well, I'll be getting MIDI con too. No. So yeah, I, I don't, it's not an intimate question because I don't use them. But I'm assuming they're just keys that you can use for anything. Assigned to anything, any hard key or something like that. Shout out from Norway. Double dinner in Frankfurt next year as well. <laughs> What's up, Johan? Thanks again. Johan's a beast, you guys. He's gonna be he's got moderator powers now. Let me give him moderator powers. Oops, I almost put you in a timeout. <laughs> Uh, I was going to talk about this position thing. So position thing, this, uh, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it a little bit, but it works a little something like this. You select your positions uh, per type and per pan or tilt over on the left side. So um, these aren't labeled yet, but they will eventually be labeled with the various pan positions that I have. So like number one is straight, which obviously means straight pan, zero deflection uh, on the x-axis. Fan out one, fan out two, fan in one, fan in two. These are just the different um, types of looks that I have for my pans. And likewise, these are the tilts. So how it works is something like this. You have your show currently running in front of you and you are thinking ahead and you're saying, okay, next uh, part of the song, I want everything to be in X position down, right? So like crossing over like that for my spots. So what I do is I will just click until I find X or I can hit load Q or I can hit go to Q, which is probably easier. So we'll say go to and we'll just click X and then go to uh, down 45. So I want them down 45. And the way I've designed this is it actually hasn't fired yet. It's just loaded into memory. And then once I want to hit go on it and I want them to move into that position, they will fade based off of my exact time. So if I have my exact time up to five, when I hit go on this macro, it will fade into that position. Then I'm also making another macro that basically fires all of them at the same time. It's kind of like having a second uh, select key. Adam, what's up, buddy? Yeah, I'll give you a mod, Anthony. You deserve a mod, just don't abuse it. If I patch in advance or do it on location, depends on how well advanced the show is. If they advanced it to me and I have all the patch information and it's like a good festival that's reliable, then yeah, I'll do it all in advance. I'll do all my layout views in advance and then I'll show up and all I'll have to do is position presets and that's pretty much it. Look at my Snapchat. Oh, you guys. 
can't look at my Snapchat right now. Loving the stream. Yeah, boy. Loving the stream. That's good to hear. <laughs> More people watching. Look at that. Thanks, guys. It means a lot that you're tuned in. All right. Um, let me kind of show you. I'm, I'm kind of proud of this. What does the swap do? Look that one up in the manual. I'm not going to explain that one. Thanks for tuning in, Jordan. Take care. My opinions on EOS. Uh, I used an Ion <laughs> once and I hated it. I just love MA. Like, uh, if you ask me about other consoles, I, I have no opinion. Um, I just don't, I'm not, I'm not well versed enough in all the consoles. I just know MA pretty well. Um, yeah, then you guys have seen all this stuff before. These are the, the center section is movements with those movement effects that we take selection with over on dish page. Yeah, so that's all of these guys. Oh, we're coming up on an hour and a half already. Jesus. We've got a few more topics to get through, and we'll probably call it in another 20 minutes. We'll do another 20 minutes. If you have any other questions, now is the time to add them because I'm looking at the chat. <laughs> if you are willing to show, how does the macro fire the positions? Yes, uh, this one I'll show a little bit, but just because I know it's too confusing for the most part um, for most people to pick it up. The, the advanced users will understand it. Can you upload my old show file? Maybe, I've been considering that. First board, um, American DJ like operator 192 or something like that. Let me look at it. Operator 192. And why does it never show up? I'm just having so many problems with XSplit. I can't even deal with it right now. Yeah, American DJ Operator 192. That was my shit. What would I, improvements, functions would I add for the future updates? That's a good topic. Let me add that to the list here. Future updates. Okay, we did PSR. ideas. I do have ideas for that. Okay, so let's talk more about these positions. So this is a little complicated. Um, it even it took me a few hours to just kind of like mentally logic my way through it myself. Um, but it goes something like this. I have all of these position presets and they're based off of pan and tilt. So each one of these presets only has pan attribute, each one only has tilt attribute, at least in these first two that say pan and tilt. I wanted to come up with a way to not have to make 80 position presets. And I've trimmed it down significantly because before I would have it where, you know, I would have X down, X mid, X high, X sky, right? So I would have four per pan and I would have to just do like a big grid of them. This I think gives me a lot more flexibility if I don't lose my voice here. So I have all the pans and all the tilts separated out. So what I do when I am selecting my pan over here, and let's pull up, uh, the command is not written in there yet. But what it's going to do is we are going to say copy pan X for uh, the spots. So you call the spots and you say, okay, I want fan out one to be called. So I'll do group one here. Group one, please fan out. And then I'm going to store that to one of two slots in my sequences. So 
if you look over, let me zoom in a little bit here. So if you look here in this sequence area, there's spot positions one and spot positions two. Beam positions one, beam positions two, beam position, or MH1, MH2. This is, you gotta think about it like this. One is active and one is on standby. So whenever spot positions one is active and being played back, it's considered the active sequence in my macros. Anything that is in spot position two is in the standby, but they switch back and forth using a macro, using a, a variable, user variable. So in the macros that I have here, uh, let me make sure you can see these. So this, all right, everybody screen cap, everybody take a picture with your phone, whatever you have to do. Um, actually, it's not that complex. I've created a macro loop here. And basically it logics out something like this. So it's saying to trigger the active slot first. So when I hit go on the macro, it is triggering the active slot. And then in the next line, it is defining the active spot slot as the other sequence. And then vice versa, changing the standby sequence to the other sequence. It's like flip-flopping them, okay? And then it has a wait, and it's basically just a loop. So then once we're done with those two, those two have been swapped in the mind of this macro, okay? So now when I hit go again, it's going to trigger the second slot, which was the standby slot originally, but is now considered the active slot. So all the time it is constantly monitoring, well, not constantly, but it is being told which one is the standby slot and which one is the active slot. So anytime I'm making selections in the spot pan, spot tilt area over here, these are all being copied into the standby slot. Okay, and as soon as I hit go, the standby slot becomes the active slot and it goes. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. <laughs> How old am I? I am 24 years old. Yeah, hardware updates, no. The hardware updates are so few and far between. Yeah, glad I could help you uh, get away from AVO. <laughs> Future hardware updates for console? What I mean, what, you're asking what I would like? Uh, a cheaper console? Yeah, I have the, the, I have the take selection stuff uh, automated already. I just haven't shown it. I don't want to show that part. Because that's the part that like really speeds up my show really fast. Possible to control effect values with encoder wheels. Yeah, of course. So uh, if you grab an effect, then it pops up and you can change based off of what is up here. That's it, and then it'll pop up on the wheels and you can move the wheels. Sorry guys, I don't have a command wing attached, otherwise I'd show you. Joystick, nah, fuck a joystick, dude. Have you actually used a joystick on a console? Do not think giving away your own unique programming operating methods puts you down as an amazing LD. No. Are the engine beats people hiring for for your next tour for the next tour? Um, I don't know. Hopefully, I really like working with those guys. Super cool. They seem to like what I do, so I, I'm not worried. The thing about the thing about like me giving away these like lighting secrets or whatever, it's I don't feel like I'm not really giving away much of anything. It's you still have to like you still have to climb the ladder. You still have to do the work yourself. Just because I show you in a YouTube video doesn't mean that when it's five minutes till doors, you'll have to figure out exactly you know. I get, let me rephrase that. What I'm showing right now to the world is n is actually not the part that people care about when they're going to hire you to be the operator or a programmer or anybody even close to touching their $250,000 lighting rig or million dollar lighting rig. They want someone who 
knows the software inside and out, who can take the least amount of time to create the best show. So they want the guy who can show up with five minutes till doors and make the show look like someone else who spent five hours programming on it. That's where the value comes in, okay? So I am not concerned with showing people this stuff because I remember how hard it was. I would have killed to have this information. Or like, it, it took me so long to learn this stuff. It's like, it feels like I stunted, I had stunted growth in this whole thing. So the more that I can share, uh, that's fine. This is not privileged information by any means. All this stuff is in the manual. I'm just kind of, I'm like uh, translating the manual. <laughs> If you would be in the grand MA3 developing team, what would you add in the software and hardware? I don't really know. I, I think the Grandma 2 is actually a really, really good console. I would maybe up the screen resolution. I would uh, maybe... I would add more executor buttons uh, for the the 20 below. I would add have more than 20. Um... Uh, yeah, I would do folders for patching. Yep, absolutely. That's a great idea. Uh, another thing I would also do is folders for um, folders for pool items. Because right now I've been kind of doing this thing, and this isn't something that's ready for me to show you yet because it's just kind of broken and doesn't really work too well. Um, I've just been using views to create pseudo folders uh, for my pools. So I'll just bounce back and forth between views to, so I'll, I'll go like, okay, spot view and then pull all my spot groups into the, the command screen. Or I'll do beam view, and then it'll pull all my, my beam uh, group pool items into the view down there. That's just how I've been kind of doing it. Do you have experience with VPU? Nope. Label titles for presets. MA3 is not finished. I don't even think it's under development. I think MA2 is going to be around for another. MA3 is already finished. I doubt it. I will be blown away if MA3 is already finished. I don't feel like that's right. Uh, colored executors. I disagree with that. I don't. Th I think the way it is right now is fine. I would like, with the higher res screens, like if they did. Uh, full HD screens rather than I think these are like 720 or something like that. Um, that would be cool. I would also really, really, really like to have the option of getting rid of the lower third of the screen and, or not getting rid of it, but making it user definable. If I don't want to see my faders there, I know what all my faders do. I'm not, I don't have to look down at my faders. Like that's the one part of the console, like I don't need on the screen and it takes up a third of it. So if I could use that as like a user definable area, that would be great. Um, what else? Yeah. Folders. And honestly, this console is pretty perfect as it is. Pretty perfect. Um, I would maybe streamline bitmapping a little more. Yeah, I was gonna say I'm 99% sure MA3 has not even, isn't even a thought in the mind of MA lighting right now. MA2, the software, the hardware is gonna be around for a long time. Um, I would say probably at least four years. This is just me purely guess, guessing four to five years before they would even consider upgrading it. This is like a really solid platform, guys. All right, what else am I missing that I not talk about? Position picker, we just talked about it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I'm just going to do this last like 15 minutes to take questions. Do you have any programming questions? Questions about the console, hardware, software? Yeah, read the entire manual. I've read the entire manual. I still, I, I reread the manual. There's a lot of stuff like, it's really weird because now, when I read the manual now at the level that I'm at, I pick up things that totally went over my head before. So definitely, you should be reading the manual like once a year. I think DMX is old enough that some sort of new technology would come over. Uh, I mean, it's just a protocol, right? Uh, the, the desk, 
it doesn't matter if you're using DMX, the desk doesn't care. It's, it's DMX is like the last thing that it calculates. So it has this whole like fucking back end of things that it is calculating in 24 bits. And then it finally just kind of like dumbs it down at the end. It's like, okay, here's a eight bit RS 235 or what 230. I can't remember what fucking protocol it is. Then it just dumbs it down to DMX level and sends it out. So there's no issue with that. Uh, we're already using scanning ACN and ArtNet, all these other protocols. It's nothing to worry about. Uh, DMX will be around for a long, long time, though. Can you tell us about your pause macro before the drops? Um, I don't really have a pause macro. Uh, pause queue, it interrupts the queue mid-fade. So if I'm fading a position... That'll do that. But if I want to pause the movement of like a, a movement effect, then I just bring the beam or I bring the, the move speed down to zero. That's it. That's how I pause it. That's it. There's no fancy pause button required. Hey, Elof, we're just about to wrap up things, but if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. DMX will never die. Yeah, scanning ACN is the network guy's best friend. I agree. What is the bla best place to start when first learning how to use Grandma 2? This YouTube channel. No, um, ACT Lighting has a bunch of resources um, where I've learned a bunch of this stuff. Um, if you go to the ACT Lighting, ACT Lighting website and click on support tab and then go to Grandma 2, it's a whole bunch of information. Mm, I'll probably buy an MA2 light within the next year. No, I don't take any lines from front of house. What do my speed groups control? Dimmer, uh, movement, and speed. Or dimmer, <laughs> dimmer, movement, and color. Only three things I care about. DMX will never die. It needs to be on a t-shirt. I agree. Maybe I should make t-shirts. When I'm on tour, do I have a fader button page that changes executors for specific songs? Depends on the tour. Um, if I'm just busking everything like I am on the San Juno Beats thing, um, there's no pages. It's just all my main page. <laughs> but if I'm doing something that has specific cues for specific songs, absolutely different pages. How do you carry positions in your base file from show to show? I just load in. I uh, So this show file that you're looking at right now is like the start file. And then... I load in via the partial show read, which we talked about a little bit earlier before you were here. Um, you can watch, rewatch the video later. And uh, actually, let me see here. <laughs> Go to my live dashboard here. I should have made you all watch an ad. Ha, huh, I'm going to play an ad. Suckers. I've been streaming for an hour and a half. I deserve one ad. I deserve this. This one ad. Uh, favorite pizza topping? Yeah, sorry guys, I had to play an ad. <laughs> I didn't know you could do that. I've been, st I, I should have been doing that like every twenty minutes or so. Damn it! Um, all my faders always intensity faders. No, 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 no. Just the first five. Do I know how to pull time code off of CDJ? Yeah, there's a there's a utility to do it. I don't do it personally though. Where's my cat? She's sleeping on my nice hoodie. <laughs> you don't have to yell. What is the RDM function used for? So it's called it's uh, stands for remote device management. I want to say, uh, and it's basically used for remotely being able to change the address, the modes. You change any function on the fixtures in the rig, 
uh, over standard DMX. You don't need to have any other special cables plugged in. Um, but with MA, you need to be directly connected to an MA node or NPU. You can't use a non-RDM splitter. Even some RDM splitters don't work. Um, but it's basically a way for the, the console to get information about the actual personality settings of each fixture, and you can change them. So if you need to change everything to basic mode for whatever reason, um, you can change all your fixtures to basic mode without having to go up there and do it. Uh, I don't use Lua. I don't know Lua. Denon Prime got pushed back. That's surprising. What is a huge blank area on the right of the console? I use that for notes. I put all my notes up there. My iPad. Yeah, don't use RDM if you don't need to. Where's my cat when I travel? Uh, if I'm only gone for a couple days, she stays here. If I'm gone for longer than like four or five days, then I, I put her in like a boarding place. The Norwegian commercials are so bad. Other than moving like, uh, you don't really need five pin. So here's the thing about five pin versus three pin DMX. Um, it's the same thing though. So the five pin connector, the data is only carried on uh, pins two and three, right? So you don't actually need pins four and five for any any system really. How do I deal with fixtures that have internal effects such as BIs? Are you talking about like macro channels, shit like that? Um, depends. If it's a festival thing, I will roll up and not worry about pixel mapping it. If it's a thing where I have time to deal with it, then I'll pixel map it. It's all about time, dude. Possible to take multiple selections for multiple lines? Yes, it is. But I'm going to have you research that one on your own. <laughs> Five pin is for professionals, whereas three pin is for beginners. Then what's four pin for? Doing MA, we've got colors for an LED bars on executors, but we cannot mix these. Oh, yeah, yeah. So here, the, I'll explain this exactly right now. This is a good question because it is kind of confusing. It has to do with linked uh, linked parameters. So think about it like this. Let's go grab some fixtures. Uh, we'll grab my hotbox LEDs. So if you move any of these faders, or if you, you change the parameters, um, so if we pull up... Uh, we change to like 50 red you'll notice all of the other colors also have a red background now too so if <laughs> four pin is for comps and scrollers yeah true um pins four and five are for the lulls <laughs> i like that and color blast yeah it's sometimes used for power on color blast uh, anyways, so what you need to do to separate out those colors is deactivate the colors you don't want. Deactivate, deactivate, and then deactivate, deactivate. So now the one with the red background is the only one that's going to get stored. So red in this case. And then we would just store that here and then change this to a temp fader. Now this fader only has the red values in it, okay? And then we do the same for green, go to 100, change this, deactivate, 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 deactivate. So now those are all deactivated. And the only thing that is active in the programmer is G, green. And then we store that. Boom, change it to temp. Now this only controls green, this only controls red. Make sense? I should do a stream on 512 because DMX day, I am gonna do a 512 stream. I don't like the shortcuts, dude. 
Stop asking me about the shortcuts. Oh, we still got a lot of people in here. Yeah, you can do off preset type as well. That's a good point. I usually don't use that feature though. But yeah, you can do it that way. So what he's saying is you can do uh, all, then change your color. And then you could do off. No, I don't think this will work. No, it won't work. What's my overall take on using Resolume on this last tour? I learned a lot of shit really fast. I'm all right at it now. Is my face bright enough? Is that this light here? Oh, guys, I fixed my camera too. You'll be happy to know. God damn. Yeah, I, I broke this super hardcore the other day, but it's working again. Which actually, I'm gonna do a vlog later today, I think. So maybe this will be the start of the vlog. Saying hi to everybody on the chat. That'll be the start of this video. Say hi in the chat, everybody. Desk setup tour? Not a chance, dude. This place is a fucking mess. Say hi in the chat. Say hi in the chat. You'll be in the video. <laughs> oh, yeah. Can I be in the vlog? <laughs> yeah, you can be in the vlog. Oh, shit. Everybody, everybody's in the vlog. <laughs> Oh, whoa, fuck. It's going so fast. It's going so fast. Holy shit. All right, report. What city are you from? Put what city you're from. City or state or country. Whatever is most recognizable. This is hilarious. Real, real vlogging hours right now. Brussels. Boston, Stut Stuttgart. Wow. Hi, mom. <laughs> you guys are funny. San Jose. I'm coming to San Jose in a couple days. Not this weekend, but next. I'll be there. Netherlands, Canada. Wow. Dallas. What up? Grand Forks. This is so cool. Vlog, vlog, vlog. Okay, I think we got most everybody. Hong Kong. Got people from Hong Kong watching the damn video. Ugh. Okay, so I'm just about ready to call it quits here. Any more questions? We need to meet up. You told us in some video about a macro you are pressing and firing all the cues, and when you hit the button again, it's firing all the cues you fired. That doesn't make any sense. Sorry, that doesn't make any sense. David, you're welcome. Thank you for watching. Uh, I don't know the name of the utility. Someone said they were going to send it to me. Denver Meetup? Yeah, sure. Uh, follow my Twitter. We'll have a, I have a lot of time, actually, in Denver. Sorry, loading the cues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I explained that earlier in the video. It'll be uploaded, so you can watch it then. How much should I sell the five R's for? Mm, I think like eight fifty a piece. Set up an iPad remote completely. I don't really use that. How's the load and go thing doing? I love it. Favorite previs software? Capture. Yeah, guys, thank you for tuning in. We've had 200 steady viewers this whole time. This is great. 
I'm going to definitely do these more often. Maybe I'll do a, I'm considering doing like a live stream programming session from an actual show. I have to come to Austria next time when I'm in Europe. I agree. Best lighting fixture on tour so far? Mm. I don't know. It's all been like elation stuff. You know, I haven't, haven't had to use any really super nice stuff. It's all clubs. We got about two minutes left in the stream. I'm the best LD ever. Aww. Tips for LD college student. Drop out. Uh, no, I dropped out. Yeah, just uh, just work a lot. Take as many shows as you possibly can. Yeah, we'll do a 512 stream. That'll be funny. Uh, I haven't been to the Netherlands yet. I would love to go, though. Hopefully soon. I'm going to start doing more and more. I just I just booked a big tour this summer, um, which... <laughs> uh, funny Facebook posts. Um, yeah, I booked a big tour this summer, and it'll be really fun to do videos of that. All these messages, Jesus. Uh, last minute questions. Did I use the Martin Axiom already? Nope. This will be uploaded as soon as it finishes processing from YouTube. I promise. Come visit you soon. Dude, I was in your hood and you, you didn't come by. What's the tour this summer? I can't tell you yet. It's song boy. Um, yeah, it'll be a bus tour. Bus tour with, uh... Zomboy. Lot real dubstep hours. When's the new release? I don't know. They don't tell me anything. Yeah, companies are always looking for experience. Just just don't go to full sale. Don't go to any of that shit. Just work shows. Learn the fucking software. It's not hard. All of it's free. Coming to Tomorrowland, no. Being Asian, <laughs> being an Asian and trying to learn MA is still hard. Yeah. Been to London? Nope. I'm still pretty new to the whole traveling for work thing. I've only been doing it for like eight months. PRG Leia light show at Pro Light and Sound was sweet. Really, really cool, actually. Uh, I won't be at EDC with Dylan. Probably not, at least. Yeah, it's kind of a bummer when you go to college and then it doesn't really work out the way you wanted to and you're just doing the same shit you would have been doing without college. When I first learned MA, about two years ago, two, two and a half years ago. Yeah, best pro tip, don't go to full sale. If there's any indication of why you shouldn't go to full sale, I have gotten uh, Snapchats and pictures from people at full sale saying like showing that they are just showing my videos in the fucking class so if there's any reason to not go to full sale that is exactly why you can just get all this shit on youtube opinion on lasers don't have one they're cool i don't know anything about them except i can program them that's about it plans to buy my own full size not yet i'm gonna probably buy a light that's about it Jason, what's up? How do you like to avoid falling into the trash and flash and trash pit? Dude, I, I swan dive into the flash and trash pit. Yeah, vlog from PLS. Uh, I'll be working on it. I'll probably be, probably be out by mid next week. Mid next week. Mechanical engineering is pretty good, uh, pretty good degree to have for an LD. I don't know if it would really help you get a job somewhere, but if you have, 
uh, it would it would definitely accelerate i think your ability to create good designs dc vlog uh that is the next one i'm doing my uh, iceland and dc vlog are one in the same because they're both kind of short so they're i'm being com i'm combining them okay beam spots or hybrids fuck hybrids beams and spots all the way dab okay had to be done how backed up are the vlogs i've got like 12 right now that are backed up actually probably more like 15 so any time that i have spare that's not dedicated to either doing this or other shows i am editing cola or seven up neither water and kale <laughs> kale smoothies and water will you be at bliss this saturday yes i will be come say hi I will be doing all the lighting at Bliss. Fuck hybrids because uh, it just doesn't play with how my show file is written right now. Later, Ka. Evo light sucks. Yep. All right, thanks guys. I'm gonna do one more ad and then we're gonna say bye. But thank you for watching. I appreciate you all. Some of you guys won't see an ad though. Touch screen gaming laptop or non touch screen with an external touch? Uh, definitely touch screen gaming laptop. Yep, I use the Lenovo Y70 and it's pretty good. Except the screen is not working right now. I think it got dropped by a TSA. Ad block for the win. Yeah, boy. Yep. That's it. We're going to call it quits. Um, thanks once again. BMW or Audi? Neither. Mitsubishi. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. We're going to call it quits here. This has been really, really fun. Again, this video will be uploaded. Uh, I'm not sure how soon. Depends on how quickly MA or <laughs> how quickly YouTube processes it all. Wow, you can tell where my head's at right now. And uh, yeah, I will see you next time around. Thanks for watching.